to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts. Let's turn to the book of Acts to chapter 6 this morning. Studying a passage that I call strong faith. And the fact that strong faith brings strong opposition. So we're going to read in the book of Acts, chapter 6, and verses 8 to 15. If you're able, please stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. Follow along, beginning at verse 8 where the scripture says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they suborned men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon them and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses who said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Father, we're thankful for your word. Uh, As we study your word, we know that you will give to us wisdom and understanding if we seek it. So we come to seek that. We hunger and thirst after your word today and truly want to apply that in our lives on a daily basis that our faith may be strong as Stephen's was. And we just give you praise and thanks for the study we have this morning under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. I call this strong faith brings strong opposition. I think one of the things that we can do is check our opposition. Not just people that oppose us, but people that oppose us because of our stand for Christ. And to see if we actually have any opposition regarding that. Most believers, uh, I believe it's probably a lot of believers. I don't know if it's actually most. I don't have a... uh, any numerical data on that, I don't believe it's available. But I will say there's a huge shortcoming in the Christian community for standing strong in the faith such that we are actually opposed by people because of our stand on the Word of God. Um, it's 2 Timothy chapter 3.12, I'll just, uh, and I'll turn over there, uh, and I usually uh, paraphrase this, but... Um, We're talking about the kind that doesn't mention faith over here. Uh, But here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Yea, and all. That's the reason I'm saying there's a huge shortfall in the Christian community for standing up for Christ such to the point that where our shortcoming, we do not receive the opposition we should have. It says, yea, and all, all, and I want to go back to verse 10 first, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, that's the scriptures, the teaching of God's word, manner of life, that's the consistency of living the believer's life according to the scriptures, purpose, that is to serve God and not to serve our own self-interest, faith, long-suffering, and love, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, where where Paul was actually stoned and left for dead, 
we find in our story today uh, that uh, Stephen, one who in our subsequent studies we'll find, was actually stoned and killed. The persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The key word here is godly. All that will live godly. We call ourselves godly because we put our faith in Christ. We're a child of God when we put our faith in Christ. Being saved by the grace of God uh, is due to our faith in Christ. Strong faith takes that uh, word of God and the will of God further, puts it into action so that we come in contact with people. They know who we are. They know what we stand for. And they oppose us because... All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It doesn't mean everybody's going to persecute us, but it means we're going to be suffering persecution. It says here, because uh, it talks about the persecutions in verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, uh, and he mentions persecutions again in verse 11. But in verse 12, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, Shall, as a very strong word in the Greek, shall suffer persecution. It doesn't mean maybe we will. It doesn't mean most people will. All will suffer persecution. Now we go back to our text over in the sixth chapter of Acts. And we're going to be talking about the faith of Stephen, if you will. Uh, faith that is godly. Uh, faith that was strong. Stephen, uh, he literally bridges the gap here between Peter, who we just finished studying our verse-by-verse -verse study through Acts so far. We've seen Peter in action and the boldness of his testimony and his preaching and his, and his opposing the naysayers and how great opposition came against him and John because of that. Later, beginning in chapter 9, we're going to see Paul and we're going to see the same kind of opposition, even stronger as we go there all the way through the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28 and see the suffering that Paul experienced because he exercised his faith in Christ in a manner that was pleasing to God. But in between Peter and Paul, we have Stephen. And what a martyr he was for the church. We understand, of course, for the Lord but we understand that Stephen was one who was a special person, but he was only special because of, of how he surrendered himself to Christ. That's what makes the stalwarts of Christianity strong. It's how they exercise the Word of God, which they acclaim to, if you will, in their lives. But it says back in... Um, in verse 5, uh, in our previous study last week, it says, and the uh, saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. They chose these seven, if you will, to handle the neglected widows, to handle that problem and to resolve it. And the first person mentioned is Stephen. And he's characterized in verse 5 as a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit. He was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. In verse 6, it says, uh, They sat before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So Stephen was approved by the apostles, strong, if you will, in faith, strong in the grace of God, strong with the Holy Spirit, being his strength. And so we find that um, in, in our text today, we're going to find in verse 9 that... Um, as part of our text, that Stephen ministered, if you will, uh, to give the uh, Jews from Gentile lands uh, the message of the gospel. And um, he would see that and back in verse 5 there, he was chosen among the thousands of people to be the one of, first of seven that were chosen to handle the neglected widows. <clears throat> 
Um, he's the only one really listed with the characterization given in verse 5. He stood head and shoulders above others. Um, I asked my boss um, uh, that became my boss, and I interviewed him at Ford by, before I ever got the job. I said, how am I going to advance at Ford Motor Company? Understanding I worked for a steel manufacturer, I started as a part-time draftsman, went to a general manager in six years. And so I wanted to know how to advance in the company. He gave me one word of advice. He says, just stand head and shoulders above the rest of the people. That's all you got to do. Well, that's all you got to do. That's work. That's, that's intensity. It's diligence. It means you got to show yourself to be somebody, not, not as to show, but to actually perform. You have to perform. And your performance has to be noticed by people, and they don't notice the rank and file. They notice the one that stands out. That's who Stephen was. The guy that exercised faith. So when they looked at the crowd, Stephen's the guy they labeled and said, he's full of faith and the Holy Spirit. They knew it. They knew it according to verse 5. Um, because it says in verse 5, after the saying, please the whole multitude, that they would appoint this, this committee to handle the issues, they chose Stephen. They chose him. He's first up. That's the guy we want. It's sort of like when I played ball as a kid. We used to go out on the ball field. We'd play a pickup game of baseball. And they get two, two captains out there. And the first one they want to choose is the best player out there. That's the first one they want to choose. Well, they chose Stephen. He was exercising his faith in God to a manner that it was so strong that the opposition couldn't even resist him. We're going to see that today. That's how strong in faith he was. But this full of faith, if you will, because... In our text today, in verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith. Full of faith. That means filled with faith. This is spiritually filled with faith. It was full of faith. Now, what is faith? And I'll just remind us, because we studied this earlier in the book of Acts. It's actual trust and confidence, if you will, in the Lord. But it's truly a firm conviction around the Word of God, the truth. The firmly convicted that it is the truth. Now, if you're firmly convicted it's the truth, you're not going to try to find a way to hem haul around portions of Scripture that have, that have things that seem to run against the grain of society. You're going to stick with it. You're going to hang with it. You're going to go with it. And you're going to proclaim it regardless of what kind of opposition you get. You're going to be strong in the faith. You've got to be strong in the Word. Because somebody who has faith that's strong, literally, they are submitted to the Lord fully. If you're going to be full of faith. And you've got to be surrendered to the Word of God and obedient to it. To the whole Word of God. Not just the portions that we like. Not just the cute sayings, the things that sound good. But we read and study it from cover to cover and it becomes our life. It becomes our life. Because we actually have life through the Gospel. The gospel is the word of God. Christ is the word. That's where we get our life from. Our new created life, if you will, in Christ Jesus. So this faith is really personal surrender. Firm conviction around the word of God. And conduct that exhibits, that exhibits the facts and truth of scripture. And um, I do want to take a look at a couple of passages here over in Hebrews. Uh, took it, take a look at Hebrews Chapter 10 and verse 38. Talking about Stephen who's full of faith. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 and verse 38. Now the just, this is a quote from Romans 1 7. Now the just shall live by faith. How do we live our lives as believers? By faith. By faith. We should have strong faith. We live our lives by faith. Um, it says, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, draw back means draw back from living by faith, if you will. Um, it says by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we have to live our, and, and the thing that gets in the way of faith is this. Because to be saved by the grace of God, we have to have faith in Christ, faith in His Word, which is Christ. 
Before we put our faith in Christ, what did we have that we lived by? Our pride, our self-righteousness. It's the same sin that brought Lucifer down from heaven as an angel to be Satan himself. He exhibited pride against Almighty God. And God cast him out of heaven along with a third of the angels. Quite an influential angel, if you will. Here he comes because pride. He said, I will, I will, I will, I will. I, five times it's recorded in Scripture. And we lived our lives that way as self-righteous and whatever we wanted to do, we did it. When we got saved by the grace of God, we gave all that up. Pride's gone. So we can no longer resort back to pride. That's the original sin. We can't resort back to pride. We can't do it. We have to keep our faith in the Word of God and faith in the word means we surrender to God and his authority over our life. And we are obedient to his word. What in that characterizes pride? Nothing. God hates the proud. He hates a proud look. So we find in our scripture there in verse 38. Now if you look over at chapter 11 in Hebrews in verse 6. <clears throat> so the just, the just are going to live by faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, oh, catch this. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So Stephen, <clears throat> Stephen, before this was written, Stephen is facing the Sanhedrin with, with literally deadly charges, charges that will take him to his death. So he had to have this kind of strong faith. But it's impossible to please God without faith. So we say we have faith in Christ. So what about when the chips get down? Do we still show and live our faith in Christ? Where do we sort of draw back? It's impossible to please God without faith. And that's not talking about people that get unsaved. Because the, the letter to the Hebrews is a letter to Christians uh, Jews, Jewish uh, Christians, if you will, who've been saved by the grace of God, to, they're, they're not mature enough. You're not mature enough. They weren't living their lives in a mature manner. And immature believers will not exercise strong faith. Because immature believers, back in chapter 5 of Hebrews, tells us that they have need to be taught again the first principles of the Word of God. Strong faith is where we actually are exercised by the Word of God. So that we know, we have the wisdom to apply that which we know through the wisdom that God gives to us and leads us into by the Holy Spirit so that we know it and we can use it in a very wise manner. So we go back to our text. This is really faith, if you will. Stephen was filled with faith. He was full of faith. So the first point I want to make here is talk about his faith. Literally full of faith. Filled up, totally controlled, if you will, by the Word of God. Because he put his faith in the Word of God. That's what he knew would get him through every day, day by day. Now, you say, well, I want to live a long time. I don't want to be like Stephen and be so strong in my faith that I'm going to be killed for it. Really? <laughs> what is it we're not willing to give God in return for the gift of salvation? What is it that's the, the pattern for love? It's Christ Himself. It's Christ Himself. Sacrificially, voluntarily went to the cross who knew no sin, never committed a sin, and gave His life to be the sacrifice for our sins. The precious Lamb of God without spot went and shed His blood for us. Why? So that through faith in Christ, we might be saved by the grace of God and given not only life, but eternal life. Forever and ever, everlasting. He was full of faith. And he was full of uh, wisdom, if you will. If you look at verse 3 uh, in this chapter, Wherefore, brethren, look among you for seven men of honest report. He had integrity, full of the Holy Spirit. Literally, Literally, the Holy Spirit was living within him and he was filled, which means he was fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And wisdom. So he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was, had integrity and he was full of wisdom. How do we get full of wisdom? 
Not by sitting our Bible on the shelf between services. I can tell you that. That's not how we get wisdom. Not by attending church once a week or twice a week. That's not how we get wisdom. It comes from being a student of Scripture, applying ourselves to the Word of God to dig out from the Word as God gives us the ability, because we can't get it on our own, but the Holy Spirit lives within us as a child of God, and the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing us into the Word of God, and we're getting that wisdom. We're getting that wisdom. See, the, the, God expects us To use what he's given us. We only got one book. It's not like we have to go to the library. And read 10,000 volumes of something. To figure out what life's all about. But people are about doing that. They go online. They go to life. Whatever it is. And they're finding all these little self-help things. About how to do better. How to have better relationships. How to do better on the job. How to be a better leader. How to be a better father or mother. You know, how to, how to interact better with other people in our, uh, our social relationships. Everything's in the Bible that we need. It's all right there. It's all right there. And we go seeking all these other sources. And that's why, I, I mean, I, I tell you, I've said it before. I'm not a student of other books. I'm a student of Scripture. And so when I read something and I understand it and I study and I remember it, I don't have to worry about whether or not it came from a book or from came from the Bible. I know where it came from because that's where I read it. <laughs> so we got to be careful. Stephen was full of faith. And so we see Stephen's faith here in verse 8. In verses 9 and 10, Stephen's wisdom, his wisdom. It says here in verse 9, <clears throat> it says, then, then, of course, see, And see, Stephen was full of faith and power. He did wonders and miracles. Uh, Wonders are those marvels that people are amazed by due to the power of God being exercised through him because he's surrendered to the Word, surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and surrendered to the power that works through him, Almighty God. And so he's performing all these signs, and signs were just that. They were indicators that this person is operating on the power of God. And the signs that were performed, the miracles and the signs, uh, were sign gifts back in the first century. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were signs that people, particularly they were ministering to the Jews, that the Jews would believe that God sent these people and God spoke through those people. That they are authentic messengers of God. And so Stephen was doing all of that stuff. We saw Peter doing that. Stephen was doing that too. Verse 8, he was full of faith and power. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. So then, after these people had seen that, then there arose certain of the synagogue. um, And the synagogue was the place, the temple was the place to worship. But Jews that had been dispersed didn't have access to the temple And so they established synagogues where they worshiped God. So there arose certain of the synagogues, um, uh, and uh, which is called the synagogue of the Libertine, the Libertines. They were descendants of Jewish slaves that were captured by Pompey, if you will, back in 63 BC and taken to Rome. These were Jewish people. And the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, uh, these were people from the cities of uh, North Africa. The Cyrenians and Alexandrians were from two different cities in North Africa, if you will. Jewish people displaced or dispersed from Jerusalem, if you will. Um, uh, and And then of Cilicia and of Asia. And these were both in Asia, if you will. And what were these Jewish people doing? They were disputing with Stephen. Oh boy. They were disputing with Stephen. See, when you know, say, well, I really shouldn't have to defend my faith. If you're out there like Stephen and you're exercising the faith of God and you're strong, being full of, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, exercising the Word of God, people are going to start questioning you. They'll start asking all kinds of questions because people hear stuff and they learn stuff wrong and they'll ask you stupid questions and 
fables and everything else, but they'll start questioning you. You've got to be able to defend your faith. You've got to be able to defend your faith. God speaks in His Word and says, always be ready to give an answer to every person who asks the reason of the hope that is in you. Every person. So only if we're well studied in the Scriptures can we actually do that. I believe a lot of us aren't strong in faith because we're not strong in the Word. We're not strong in the Word. So, you know, I mean, you know, I, I learned enough about differential equations uh, in, in college uh, that I've got a great grade on, on that. But today, if somebody come and ask me what an integral equation is, Oh boy, I have no clue. I, I know it's, uh, it's something about the area under a curve and how to measure that so that you can do all these other things with math because everything sort of evolves around that. According to the mathematicians, I wouldn't have a clue. But had I kept studying math, had I kept studying that, I'd be as good at it today and probably better, much better than I was then. The problem is we get saved by the grace of God and we just sort of... Bible sits right there next to the door, you know, on the way out, on the way in, sort of drop it off place. Um, we ought to be students of the word. And that's what Stephen, Stephen was. And they began to question him. They began disputing with him. Um, the actual uh, definition of disputing uh, is it's a formal, formal hearing, if you will, or discussion or debate is probably a, perhaps a better word this uh, disputing, they were debating him in the synagogue. Now, uh, and you had all of these Jewish uh, people coming in from outside the area, and they were in the synagogues, and they began to debate him. And of course, he was teaching in the synagogues like, like uh, Peter was, and like Paul did later. It was where they were teaching. So all these people got up and they started disputing with him, and raising questions and issues. And then he had to become a defender of the faith. If you're going to be strong in faith, you have to be able to defend your faith. You can't defend something you're not strong in. You can't defend it. You can't do it. I told you about the, my, my first um, uh, my analytical geometry and calculus professor in college. My first one wrote up on the board and did three chalkboards all the way across three sides of the room. Big, long equation and came up with one was equal to zero. Not one person in the room could dispute that one was not equal to zero. We know that it was not one. One equals zero. We know that's not correct. But we couldn't dispute it. So we were at the mercy of her pointing out where she made an assumption on the board. But see, we get in front of people and they want to ask questions about our faith. And our faith is based on the Word of God. So we have to know something about the Word of God. And so we can't even debate people about the Word of God because we don't know enough about it. So we sort of shy away from those times when we might think we might be called into question on something because we talked about an issue. We should be no fear, and we'll see that a little later in this, but we should be no fear in us what God will do if we're truly students of Scripture. Now, if we're lazy regarding the Scripture, it won't apply. But if we're truly students of Scriptures, we don't have to be concerned about people disputing with us. So they were seeking to undermine him, examining him, if you will, arguing with him, trying to reason with him about how he wasn't right. So in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They weren't able to resist it. <laughs> it literally irresistible. They couldn't oppose him. They couldn't withstand him. They couldn't stand against him. They couldn't prevail against him. They were no match for Stephen because the power of the Holy Spirit was working in him. And they could not resist the power. It wasn't Stephen. It was God who was working through him. But God's not going to work through someone who's not interested in studying the scriptures and learning how to do that. We may not have all the answers, but if we're students of scripture, God's going to give us the answer when we need it. So we see he was full of wisdom and is so wise that all of these people weren't able to resist what he was saying. They, they did not have a good answer. They sort of had to clam up. 
Well, you know, so we got the big debate stage here over in the synagogue, and all these people had come from all these other areas, from North Africa, they come from Asia, and they've all come over here, and they're debating against Stephen, and they can gain no ground on him. Now keep in mind that the Sanhedrin, we've been discussing as we've been going through here, the 71 members of the Sanhedrin, the 70 members plus the high priest, um, they weren't happy with Peter. And now here's Stephen. <laughs> and they're not happy with Stephen. And that's what brings the rest of the story to us, beginning in verse 11. So here he was. So beginning in verse 11, I call this Stephen's opposition. So if you're going to have strong faith and exercise the wisdom that God has given to us, then what we're going to find is people are going to oppose us. We saw the opposition beginning where they were trying to undermine him, but they weren't able to resist him. And what they wanted to do was resist him. They couldn't resist the power of God. Nobody can. But what they could do is they could attack him personally. So that's what they resorted to. So I call this Stephen's opposition in verse 11. Then, you see in verse 9, then, because we see Stephen is this man full of faith, then, as he was teaching in the synagogue, all these opposers rose up. They couldn't resist. So then, in verse 11, they suborned, literally, they bribed people secretly, and coached them. That's what that word means. They, they sought them, selected them, coached them, bribed them to oppose Stephen. So they, they suborned men who said, here's what the ones who they had coached to say these things. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They paid people to say that. It wasn't true. They paid people. They hired people. They coached them on what to say. Why would they say that he blasphemed Moses and God? Because blasphemy is a, is a crime to the Jews that's punishable by death. By stoning to death. We all know Stephen was stoned to death. This is the accusation that came up that enabled them in their system, in their system, to legally not right before God, to legally, according to their laws, stone Stephen to death. So they hired some people. They had, they, they, he wasn't blasphemy. They had to pay people to come in and lie and, and be deceitful about it. And that's what they did. They said, we have heard him. We've heard him. We've heard him blaspheme God. Punishable by death. So, not only, not only did they hire and bribe uh, and coach uh, these, these people to do that and to make these accusations which were lies. But then in verse 12, and they stirred up the people. Woohoo! Get them all excited. Rally them around a cause. Right? So they got, it's sort of like I, I see some of these peaceful demonstrations, the liberal media calls it today, where they get out and they set cars on fire and destroy buildings and, you know, they rampage stores and kill people and, you know, hurt people and all this kind of stuff. Peaceful debates. People get excited. They get stirred up. And you see when they have those big riots, they just sort of, a, they build momentum. And they get to the point where it just sort of explodes. And that's what the Jewish people were trying to do. They're trying to get this crowd stirred up. So they already got the accusation to work with. Now all they got to do is stir the people up with it. Get them excited. That's what it means to be stirred up. Get excited. So they stirred up the people. That's the general populace. And the elders and the scribes. And came upon him and caught him. Uh, literally this came upon him and caught him. Is seizure with violence. Literally with violence. Because what they did, it says they brought him, literally they dragged him to the council. They dragged him to the council. We'll see as we go further in the book of Acts that uh, we read about um, Paul's uh, sufferings and persecutions in 2 Timothy 3 a few moments ago over at Iconium and Lystra and Derby, And that's where he was actually drugged out of the city. They dragged him out of the city, stoned him to death, like they did Stephen, 
But they couldn't kill Paul. They thought they left him for dead, thought they killed him, but they didn't. So they, they caught him and they brought him to the council. We know from our previous studies, the council is the Sanhedrin, the highest authority in the Jewish land at that point in time. Sort of equivalent to what we would call our Supreme Court here. There's no, there's no appeal beyond the Sanhedrin. This is the end of the line. This is where the buck stops. Whatever the Sanhedrin says goes, like in our land, whatever the Supreme Court says, that's it. That's the law. So they, they dragged him over to the council with violent violence. So, in thir verse 13, that's not all they did. Then, when they got to the hearing before the Sanhedrin, they set up. They set up. They prearranged and had everything set properly to accomplish their goal. They set up what kind of witnesses? False witnesses. Because see, in those days, the proof was in two or three witnesses. So they had those, if you will, and the people that they bribed, they had those witnesses who said, we heard him blaspheme Moses and God. So now they're in the court. And that was in the synagogue when they were debating. Now what they're doing is before the Sanhedrin, they're now setting up these false witnesses who are going to lie. They're going to lie about Stephen. And they got all the people excited about it so that you can see the momentum is growing against Stephen. His strong faith has literally brought strong opposition. Why? Because his faith was so strong, he was so submitted to God and obedient to his word that they couldn't resist what he was saying because as he was speaking, God was giving him the ability and the power and they weren't able to resist God working through Stephen. So then they had to do all this other stuff to get to him and they dragged him to the court violently. They set up false witnesses. No doubt, likely they bribed them as well. They set up these false witnesses who said, and here's the testimony that brings, if you will, a judgment by the council. So these false witnesses, here's what they said. This man ceaseth not to speak, see the same word? Blasphemous. Blasphemy is the charge. And they have secretly conspired to set up these false witnesses to say the same thing. You see the consistency in what they're doing. They set up false witnesses who said, This man ceaseth, ceases not. He doesn't stop to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Literally against God and Moses again. And then, because he said in verse 13, that this man ceases not. Verse 14, For we have heard him say, <laughs> We've heard him. We're eyewitnesses. We've heard him say that this Jesus, when you see somebody put this Jesus, some, you know something's going on. This Jesus of Nazareth, see they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah to come and set up the kingdom. They, they didn't get it in the Old Testament because they didn't actually have faith in God. Even though they said Abraham was their father, who was the father of Abraham being the father of faith, they weren't actually, didn't actually have faith in God like Abraham did. They had an agenda. Their agenda is, we, it's really a self-righteous and a, pr a proud thing. They wanted a world leader on their throne that would handle, because that's what it said in the Old Testament, that Christ is going to come, that the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to reign on earth, over the whole earth. And he is. But they missed the part about the baby coming in the major, born of the virgin, Mary, that Isaiah prophesied about and others. They missed that part because that didn't serve their interest. All they wanted was a king to sit on the throne that would take care of everybody. They weren't interested in spiritual matters. They were interested in governmental matters and protection against the enemies. Keeping in mind that at that time, it was nothing for one nation to go against another and to kill them and destroy them. So they had legitimate concerns, but they just didn't have trust in God to handle those. So they set up false witnesses, and in verse 14, they, uh, they said, We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. <laughs> 
what we find is it's now an age of grace and not of law. So they sort of got hung up on that. And we understand um, that um, Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy this place because Jesus is going to bring down every stone. There's not going to be one stone standing upon another at the end. It's going to bring them all down. All the buildings that we build, they're all coming or crumbling down. I remember when the guy built the glass house out in California, everybody just awed over this big structure. You know, it's all coming down one day. It doesn't matter how beautiful your structure is. What matters is what's in your heart and who are you worshiping. The place where you worship is just a place of worship. You don't need to waste millions of dollars because all that does is attract crowds because of the architecture or the engineering. That's not how you attract people. You really attract people through the Word of God, not through your building. So we're not real excited about the building. We ought to be good stewards over what God's given us, and we are doing that. But it says here, we've heard him say Jesus is going to destroy this place, um, and he's going to bring, because, you know, they were all about the place where they worship this, and Jesus was saying, you know, God's going to bring all these stones down one off top of the other. It's going to bring them all down. And so certainly he had taught, but he didn't teach as they had. They lied about it as well. They were very deceitful. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> this was the opposition, if you will, that certainly opposed him. And uh, there was a conspiracy, as you can see, by these um, folks that were mentioned back in verse 9. You know, the Libertines, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, the people of Cilicia, and Asia, and uh, we find them setting up false witnesses, bribing people to come in and, and spread error, hate, and discontent, and uh, falsehoods about Stephen so that they could get him out of the way. What do they want to do? Get him out of the way. You know, if we have strong faith in our company of friends, people might want to get us out of the way. <laughs> they might. I firmly believe this is, that's why I've titled the lesson what I have. I didn't get the phrase out of the scriptures, but I'm convinced by the, by, by, by the power of God in me that when we see this, Stephen was one who exercised strong faith and it brought strong opposition. Peter exercised strong faith. It brought strong opposition. Paul exercised strong faith brought strong opposition. Jeremiah exercised strong faith, brought strong opposition. Noah exercised strong faith, brought strong opposition. It's a consistency of Scripture. And so the comfort is uh, that we have is that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. We're all going to suffer, except that is a fact. The scripture also tells us that he who gains his life shall lose it. See, we're so, we're, we want to protect not only our life, but our reputation uh, for friendships and for social activities and all these things that mean so much to us. We need to drop all these things, not worry about that so much. We ought to be concerned about whether or not we're actually being a witness for the Lord. And is our witness strong based on strong faith within us, being full of the Holy Spirit, full of, um, of faith, if you will. So in verse 15, what we find here is Stephen's presence. Now here's what happens. They came and they made these accusations. I mean, they set up these false witnesses. They, they bribed people. He's now before the Sanhedrin, the 71 people in the council here. And in verse 15, and all that sat in the council, that's all 71 of them. They looked steadfastly on him. Literally, they fixed their eyes on him. they staring with an intent gaze. They're looking at Stephen. They set up these false charges, and if found guilty, he'll be sentenced to being stoned to death. Or looking at him. I'm sure some of them are saying, what are you going to do now, big boy? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, they, they thought they had him. They probably felt great when they stoned him to death. But between this council meeting and the stoning to death, Stephen gives a powerful message, which we'll begin studying uh, next couple of times. And the powerful message 
was brought out, if you will, by Stephen being undeterred by those who were against him. Undaunted faith, we called it earlier in the books of Acts. So, all that sat in the council, they were looking steadfastly on him. They couldn't take their eyes off him. They were no doubt expecting, what are you going to say now, big boy? What do you got to say, huh? He didn't say anything, did he? Uh, not at this point. <clears throat> Later he does. <laughs> so, um, they looked steadfastly on him, and what did they see? They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Glowing. 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 They expected, I'm sure, because he's accused of blasphemy. Stephen knew what blasphemy meant. He was a Jew. He knew. Everybody in the room, the 71 plus Stephen, they all knew what blasphemy meant. We see clearly that was the charge. And there's no, there's no answer from Stephen. But they see him calm, relaxed. And his composure and presence itself is powerful. Let's take a look over at Exodus chapter 34 for a minute. Um, Exodus chapter 34, the end of that chapter. Exodus chapter 34. Moses goes up to the mount, receives the law for the second time. Um, and uh, in verse 29, Exodus 34 and 29. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tab tables of testimony in Moses' hand. This is the law for the second time. When he came down from the mount, that Moses literally knew not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He didn't know his face was shining. He didn't have a mirror. And there was no sensation in his skin that gave him a hint. He didn't know his face was shining as he was talking with the Lord. So in verse 30, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. His face was shining. What would you think? Walked into your house and saw one of your family members, and all of a sudden their face was just shining. Right? It's, I mean, bright, shining face. They were afraid to come near him. In verse 31, And Moses called unto them, Keep, Moses didn't know his face was shining. He called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. He told them the law. And till Moses had literally finished there, um, uh, the word done, speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. By this point, he knew, no doubt because people were talking to him, but it had been some time. In verse 34, but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spoken to the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So, and I'm not saying it's the same. But it's uh, Scripture supports Scripture and interprets Scripture. But if we go back to Acts chapter 6 and last verse 15, it says that they were looking steadfastly on him and they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel, literally radiating the glory of God. Another sign that God worked through Stephen. That angered them, we'll find as we go on from here. But we need to be careful... <clears throat> Look at, look at how God used a man. Stephen was a person just like you and me. The difference between Stephen and us is commitment. Commitment. Commitment to the Word of God. 
commitment to the cause, and, and the opportunity to be where God wants us to be. God doesn't use everyone to be a Stephen. God wants to reach all the people. It's not His will that anybody perish. So if it's not God's will that anybody perish, then what is His will? That people be saved by His grace, right? And so that's why He gave His Son at Calvary. is to, for people to be saved through the free gift of salvation for those that put faith in Him. So in all walks of life, here, God called Stephen to be before the highest court in the land. Where is He calling us? To be witnesses. Where is he calling us to be witnesses? They say, well, in the church. No, I don't think so. <laughs> this is our huddle. We study the Word of God, we learn the Word of God. And it's sort of like in football you know, you go in and you call the play. You know, you got all that teaching and the videos you watch and all that training and everything comes together. You go into the huddle and now you're ready to go. So we have, we're, we're learning the Word of God. And as we learn the Word of God and learn how to live our lives godly uh, in God's eyes, then we break the huddle and where do we go? We go out into the world. And you go to different places than I go to. And God uses His people to go into all the venues of the world so they can reach people. Not all people are going to react like the Sanhedrin did, but that's where God had Stephen go. And we hear about that. But it doesn't make our responsibility any less. Are the people that we socialize with any different than the people on the Sanhedrin? They're people that need to be saved by the grace of God. I saw somebody posted on social media years ago, and it just said, people need the Lord. <laughs> And it comes from a song, but it, everybody needs Jesus. Not everybody receives Jesus by faith, but everybody needs him. So in our, in our field or venue of people, are we living our lives in accordance with God's word, fully surrendered to his word? Obedient to his word, surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit, and boldly bringing out the truth of God's Word. What is it Paul said in Romans 1, 16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Sometimes I think that all the studying we do and all the attention we give to the Word and as much as we pray, and that we, we really don't sense the need to give it to others. We don't sense the need. But the Word of God, not my testimony, not your testimony, not our presence, the Word of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. Why do we not talk to that neighbor or that friend or that associate? Because we're Not because we're ashamed of the Word, we think. But if we're ashamed to mention the Word to somebody else, we are ashamed of it. We are ashamed of it. That's the reason we don't bring it up. Because we're ashamed of it. Or we're fearful. We're fearful it might, it might undermine a relationship or an association with somebody else. Or it might cost us a job. Might cost us some advantage that we have. Might cost us salary. There are different reasons why we cow, cower down and don't buckle up like Stephen and just tell it like it is. And what we're going to find as we go on um, uh, into, into chapter 7 is how Stephen responds. Because he's going to respond. He's going to respond. And guess what? He's not going to back off one iota. If it cost him his life, it cost him his life. If it cost us a friendship, let it cost us a friendship. If it cost us a salary, let it cost us a salary. Because if we gain our life, we'll lose it. But if we lose our life, we're not... Because that's what Paul said. He said, I count not my life dear to myself. Obviously, Stephen didn't either. True people of God will not consider their life or their reputation or anything else about who they are to be of more importance than the Word of God that God wants us to share with other people. That's what we're here for. We're here to be messengers.
Jesus told his disciples that I want you to go into Judea, Samaria, and into all the world. Into all the world. That means wherever we go, take the word of God. Because God wants his word to go. And there's going to come a day, we don't know the day or the hour. And those who claim to don't know it either. No one knows the day or the hour when the Lord's going to come in the air and take his children home. And then it's eternally too late. It's eternally too late. There's coming a day when there will be no more opportunity. The scripture tells us that we need to take advantage of every opportunity. Walk circumspectly, if you will. Ephesians chapter 5. Walk circumspectly so that we can take advantage of every opportunity. And every opportunity that slides by may be another person that goes to hell because we didn't bother to do something about it. And so we all can receive conviction from this message. Because I don't care how good we are at sharing the word of God. We're probably not good enough. None of us are perfect. Here's a guy that God used mightily. Set him up in the scriptures as an example to us. That was not the purpose of his being there. But the purpose that he served was one to bring conviction upon people. And I believe Paul was the guy who was, you know, he was holding the coat of those who stoned Stephen to death. And... You know, when it says Stephen was debating these people in the synagogue, these people he was debating in the synagogue, uh, some of those were from the hometown of, of Saul, who became Paul. Paul may have been one of the ones. We don't know. Or at least he knew some of them that were there debating him. What we don't know, what, what we do know is we ought to be bold with the Word of God and share it with others. It's really not a complicated thing. It becomes a personal thing that we don't want to commit to it. Let's not be ashamed of the Word of God. We should be as willing to talk about the Lord as we talk about the weather. Let's put, let's put it that simply. We'll talk about the weather to anybody. Anybody. We'll talk about the weather. People get together in a crowd, you know, if you don't have anything else to say, you know. Uh, hey, the sun's, sun's shining great outside today, isn't it? A beautiful day. Oh, yesterday was awesome. We talk about the weather to everybody. We ought to talk about the Word of God to everybody because the Word of God is much more important than the weather. Let's stand together in prayer, if you will. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for Your love, for Your mercy, and for Your grace. We see Stephen as an example in Scriptures in our lesson today, as an example of one who's full of, full of faith, full of wisdom, full of grace, because your grace was operating fully within him. And it's your favor that is given to us unmeritoriously. Not something we deserve. Stephen didn't earn it. You gave it to him because he was willing to be your vessel of honor wherever you sent him. May we be willing to do the same thing. As we leave here today, may we go with a conviction from the Word of God, that, that our service needs to be improved for you. Because we never get to the point where our service is perfect. We have a lot of improvement. And for Father, we just ask that as you give us that power, the unction from the Holy Spirit, that we'll fully surrender to the Holy Spirit, we'll be obedient to your Word, and go out with boldness and confidence as these early disciples and apostles did. And we'll give you praise and thanks for what you'll accomplish through us, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.